Hi, I'm Bob Balch. Thanks for tuning into my That's Jesus channel. In today's video, you're going to see one of my sermons from the Christmas season of 2020, where I talk about the joy of Jesus. Thanks for tuning in. Today. I thank you for Sundays. I love Sundays, Father. I thank you for today. I just ask, Lord, that the people who hear the message today, they have open hearts, open minds, that you touch them in ways that makes them realize how much you love them. Father, I ask that you be with me. Give me the words to say. Give me the right way to say it so that people know that you love them. In Jesus' name. Amen. The joy of Jesus is today's sermon title. One of the uh, Advent candles, and in fact, week three of Advent was about joy. It's the joy that we get because Jesus came 2,000 years ago and the joy that we have expecting him to come again. I mean, we should have a lot of joy. But did you know that there are Christians who say that Jesus didn't have joy? I mean, this, uh, this is, a, a, I think, a, a heresy that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years that there's some very famous theologians that say Jesus never even laughed. Mm. Now, I cannot accept that. But, you know, it's true that if you look through the Bible, you will not find any scriptures that say Jesus laughed or chuckled or smiled or anything like that. It's just not there. But a lot of us think of this one scripture that says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Right? Mm. Remember that scripture? Well, that's from Nehemiah in the Old Testament. It's really not really talking about Jesus. It's Yahweh. Yahweh, when, when the children of Israel were starting to read the law again, it made him very happy. But what I'd like to do today, uh, is building off of that sermon title, The Joy of Jesus, I'd like to, to give you a sermon. It's got two main points, and then uh, three little sub points underneath my second one. The first point, point A, is the joy of Jesus. And the second point is the joy of Jesus. Amen. This is what that means. The first point is the joy of Jesus, the joy that comes from Jesus. And the second point is the joy that Jesus had, the joy that he possessed. Um, did Jesus bring joy to others? The word joy is used about 60 times in the New Testament. <clears throat> 21 times were used by Paul. He's a very happy writer, I guess. And then uh, John and Luke used it about a dozen times each, but you have to kind of count up, you know, Luke and Acts and John, 1st and 2nd, 3rd John. About a dozen times each. But all of the writers of the New Testament use the word joy. It's all over the New Testament. But does it say that Jesus gave people joy? Well, let me put it this way. He started giving people joy before he was even born. In utero, you know the story. Mary is visited by the angel Gabriel. He says, you're going to have a baby even though you're a virgin. She's like, what? And he says, it's true. You're going to. And then um, Luke 139 says that at that time... She hurried off to her cousin, to her, well, maybe her cousin Elizabeth, who was already six months pregnant with John the Baptist. And when she got there, it's just a couple of days walk, and she's a teenager. If she took maybe two or three days to get ready, by the time she gets there, she's only two weeks pregnant, less than two weeks. Jesus is just a little psycho. And John the Baptist is this embryo inside of Elizabeth, and the scripture says that he shot for joy. Amen. I, when, I, when I think of that, I get this picture, you know, those, those photographs, you can see the silhouette of someone with their hands up in the air, and their knees are bent, and their chins are parallel to the ground. That's one of the things he jumps for joy. That's probably pretty uncomfortable for Elizabeth, but that's what he does. He jumps for joy. Let's go to Luke 2, at his birth. Christ gives joy as well. Uh, Jeff mentioned in, in his sermon um, uh, for Christmas Eve, Charlie Brown Christmas, right? Luke 2, 10 through 11, Linus said, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born in this day the city of David, the Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Short time later, Jesus is still a child. You know the three wise men didn't come at his birth. It was just a little bit later. But just a little while later, Jesus is still a baby. And the three wise men, the, the, the Magi, come. 
And um, Matthew 2.10 says, When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding joy. Exceeding joy. And when they were in his presence, they kneeled down and worshipped him. That was one of our Advent talks that my wife had. So from his earliest days, Jesus brings joy to those around him. Matthew um, talks about that. Luke talks about that. John talks about that. Luke John 3, the ministry of Jesus has just started. Just started. And his disciples are starting to baptize in the Jordan River uh, as the crowds are starting to come to him. But John the Baptist is still, he's not in jail yet. He is, he is, his ministry is years old. He is one of the most popular people in, in all of Israel. And his disciples come to him, John 3, 26, they say, Rabbi, this man who is with you on the other side of the Jordan River, the man to whom you gave witness, he is now giving baptism, and everyone's going to him. Now I'm going to have a little 10-minute lesson on the side of the Jordan that Jesus was baptized on, and how significant that is, but we won't go there. Just remember that John the Baptist has been famous for quite a while. He is actually the superior in fame at this point. Amen. And this is what he says, John 3, 29. The groom, Jesus, the groom is the person to whom the bride belongs. Amen. The best man, me, the best man who stands and listens to him is overjoyed when the groom speaks. And I love this. Amen. This is the joy that I feel. Amen. John saying, hey, I'm just a supporting character in this world. I'm not the main guy. I'm just happy to be here and play a small part. Yeah. I'm overjoyed with that. Now, John the Baptist is happy, and he's just in the wedding party. What do you think the bride is going to be? We're the bride. Amen. We're the bride. We're the ones who are eagerly awaiting his advent, eagerly awaiting our groom to return and take us with him. Woo. We're the bride. Amen. There's a tremendous amount of joy in following Jesus and, and being his bride. And Jesus even gives us explicit permission to have joy Amen. because of him. Do you know that? Look at Matthew 25. Jesus says twice, not once, twice. Jesus says, Matthew 25, 21 and 23, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Amen. Jesus wants us to have joy. I can go on. Jesus was resurrected, Matthew 28, 8. The women go to the tomb, and they left quickly with fear and great joy and reported it to his disciples. A little while after that, Jesus suddenly appears in the midst of all these disciples, and they, they still could not believe it, according to Luke 24, 41. They could not believe it because of their joy and excitement. We have a lot of joy simply to be with Jesus. Can you imagine the joy we would have if we were to see him? Amen. Actually lay our eyeballs on Jesus. Just catch a glimpse of Amen. Jesus. How much joy. I mean, I can't even. You, you, you think of the most famous person that you can. And how much joy you would have just to be in the room. Not even to talk to them. Just to be in the same room with them. Think about Jesus. How much joy that would be. But you, you know you really don't even have to see Jesus to have joy. First Peter. First Peter 1 a. Even though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious what? Joy. I love the next verse. Why do we have that joy? Verse 9. Because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation Woo! of your souls. Amen. Jesus gave joy then and he gives joy now. And that's just a fact. It is. But did Jesus himself have joy? That's point B in the sermon. Maybe you've seen those memes on Facebook. There's this statue, I don't know where it's at, but it's got this statue of Jesus and he's like, like that, and he's smiling, and it has these memes and everything. You can go, you just search on the internet for laughing Jesus. And there are all kinds of artwork that you can find of Jesus laughing. That's how I picture Jesus in my mind's eye. Just a, a guy that just does belly laughs. 
Amen. And he tells stories, and he is approachable. That's how I personally think of Jesus. Did you know that a surprisingly large number of professional comedians are on medication to help with their depression? Just because you give someone joy and happiness doesn't mean that you're happy. Right? right? But was Jesus that suffering servant who never a smile cracked his lips? Was he that kind of a, a guy? Some people think so. And I'm not going to call him stupid in public. Well, maybe in private. But Jesus had to be just a, a very lighthearted, laughing person. Luke 10, starting in verse 17. Let me put some context on this passage. Jesus is sending out the 72, not the 12, the 72, and they're going to go to all the cities that Jesus is going to be um, preaching to. It's kind of like this big advertising campaign to say, hey, the circus is coming down. It's not the circus, it's Jesus. They're letting people know that Jesus is going to be preaching. And they come back. Now, this is not the 12. The 12 represents, of course, the 12 tribes of Israel. This is the 72, which represents the Sanhedrin. Which, since Jesus sends them out in Judea, uh, Judea, that's pretty significant. It's like a poke in the eye of the Jewish elite. But he sends these 72, and they come back, and they are ecstatic. I mean, they are giddy. They are, they are just out of their mind with wonder. Luke 10, 17 says they return with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Now, you have to admit, that's got to be pretty cool. Can I tell you a demon story? Okay. It's March 2016. I have been sober for about three weeks at that time. Um, now, in my sobriety, I've gone, in, in decades, I've been so sober for more than a month, maybe once or twice. And my wife is my rock. And she's praying with me. She's praying for me. She's encouraging me. She is checking in on me. She's giving me phone calls. She is my rock. And I'm three weeks into this, and she says, Bye, I'm going to Romania on a mission trip. <laughs> for a bunch of women. I mean, who cares? Right. Anyway, so it's the third night that she's gone, and I'm laying in my bed all alone. And I'm not doing well. My stomach is hurting, my teeth are chattering, I am jittery, my mind is, is racing a thousand miles an hour. I am praying to the Lord, Lord, please make this temptation go away. Lord, make these pictures go away. Lord, make this feeling go away. Lord, do something. Please do something. And I don't know how I knew what to do when I did. I mean, in the tradition that I grew up in, this was... Not something that people would really talk about, maybe in the back room or something, but it was never from the pulpit. And I just knew that I had to do this. I took a deep breath, and I knew that it had to be by the authority of Jesus, the command of Jesus, but in the name of Jesus. And I screamed at the top of my lungs, I'm face down on my bed, my hands above my head, face down. Nothing on me but a sheet. And I scream in Jesus' name. I command, in Jesus' name, every demon, in Jesus' name, every spirit that's not from God, in Jesus' name, anything that is not of the Lord in this house, in this room, on this property, in Jesus' name, I bind you and gag you, in Jesus' name, I cast you out, in Jesus' name, to the pit of darkness reserved for Satan and his angels, in Jesus' name, amen. Glory, yeah. And there was a hush in the room. It was quiet before. I was the only one home, but my mind had been racing and it was noise in my mind. But it was a hush. And at that moment, the sheet floated down on my body, and I had no idea that it had even been hovering over me. And every temptation was gone. Amen. Now that's that's my demon story. It's a true story. You may not believe it, but it's a good story, right? That's what happened. Amen. And since then, the temptation has never been that bad again. Because who the Lord sets free 
spring it in. Now, we have, uh, we love this idea of, of casting out demons. And that's what these 72 come back to. Jesus, they're like, Lord, even the demons submit in your name. And I can see Jesus doubling over in laughter. Really? Tell me more. Come on. What else did they do? What did you say to this one? What did you say to that one? Did you, did you, did you throw dirt on them or something? I can just see him just laughing as they're telling all this. Because he's like, David, it's whatever. And they're so excited. And then Jesus tells them something. Luke 10, 18. Jesus says, yeah, I was watching Satan fall from heaven. Now, this really doesn't have a lot to do with my sermon, but I'm a teacher, so I'm going to stop right here and tell you what that means. Whenever you have the metaphor of lightning in Scripture, it does not mean that it was fast. It has nothing to do with speed. Lightning means it was seen from everywhere. That's what lightning means in Scripture. So when Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning, it means Hey, when you are casting out those demons, I saw him fall over there, and I saw him fall over there, and I saw him fall over there, and I saw him fall over there. I saw it. And the other thing that you need to know about this is the word saw. In the Greek, it is in an imperfect tense. Now, Jeff can probably talk to you more about this than I can. But a perfect tense of saw would be something like, I saw my son graduate. It happened once I saw it was done. This is the imperfect tense of Saul. It means something like this. I saw it, and I'm continuing to see it. And I'll probably see it again until it's done. It's kind of like uh, football. I used to coach football when I was a teacher. And it's kind of like the, the football team for a school that's never won hardly any games. And it's the first game of the season, and they won. And all the players are in the locker room, and they're saying, Coach, 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 did you see? Did you see that every time we had the ball, we, we got at least five yards? Did you see every time we had it, we scored? Did you see that every time the defense was on the field, that the other team couldn't do anything? Did you see? And the coach says, yeah, it's the first game of the season. I saw us winning the district championship. That's what that means. It's imperfect. I saw this, but it's going to continue. And so Jesus says that. And basically when he says that, he's saying, get used to it, folks. Get used to saying, follow. Jesus continues, Luke 10, 19 and 20. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. That's pretty cool. Amen. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Brothers and sisters, don't rejoice that the demons will flee at the sound of your voice in Jesus' name. Rejoice that your name is written in heaven. Don't rejoice that you're part of a core team at a church like this. That's just temporary. You need to rejoice that your name is written in heaven. Don't rejoice that everybody here knows your name. That's nice, congrats to you, but if your name is not written in heaven, so what? Because ultimately the joy of the Lord comes when your name is written in heaven. Amen. At three sub points under point B. Whether or not Jesus had any joy. And those, those sub points are about where Jesus got his joy from. Number one, let's read the next word, the next verse, Luke 10 21. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit. Let me say that again in case you missed it. Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit. Amen. The joy of the Lord is my strength is an Old Testament scripture. And it, it, mean, it happens just once or twice in the Old Testament. It means Yahweh had joy maybe just once or twice. Jesus and joy. We have this verse and maybe one other that say Jesus had joy. But the Holy Spirit. That's different. Acts 13, 52. The church received joy through the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, 22. One of the fruits of the Spirit is what? Joy. Romans 14, 17. The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. 
First Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.6, for you, you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you have the Holy Spirit, brother, just correct that, if the Holy Spirit has you, you're going to have joy. Woo. That's just what the Holy Spirit does. I don't know if that's in his job description and it's written down somewhere, but that is what is associated with the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit has you, you're going to have joy. So, this is the conclusion that I have. If Jesus had the Holy Spirit, then guess what? He's got joy. Amen. And I can tell you confidently that at least from his baptism, Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit at a measure that we cannot even approach. So if people say, well, I don't think maybe that Jesus had joy. Are you kidding me? Of course he had joy. Psalm 35 says, weeping is only for a night, but in the morning we have joy. Maybe some amount of joy may come in the, uh, come in the morning, but real joy comes through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Point number two about where joy comes from. We found by looking at the vocabulary in this text, Luke 10. It is, in essence, relationship talk. We have words like father and son and little children. Luke 10, 21. I praise you, Father, Amen. Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hid these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father. For that is what you would please to do. All things have been committed to be by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. You understand what I'm trying to say? Joy comes through your relationship with God. And your relationship with God comes through Jesus Christ. Amen. The great joy of the 72 was not that Satan was being cast down from heaven. It was not that they were casting out demons. The joy of the 72 is that children were being brought in. That's the joy of the 72. Rejoice that your name has been written in heaven, folks. It's not like it's being written on a tax roll. It's not like it's being written on some type of a membership roster. It's not like your name is written on an invitation to a party. This is the type of a name that is like you get at a wedding. This is the type of a name that's, that's a new name. This is the name that goes on a, a, a birth certificate. This is the type of name that goes on a new birth certificate. This is an adoption name. This is the name that you get that's written in heaven, that is written in the blood of Christ himself. And it's not going to be. That's where true joy comes from. But let me stop right there. I'm going to ask you two questions. Is your name written in heaven? Yes. If it's not, what in the world is stopping you? Mm -hmm. I'm just going to share this one little tidbit. That's true that you will have lots of joy when your name is written in heaven. But Luke 15, 7 says, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons that don't need repentance. Don't keep putting it off. Because one day, it's going to be too late. Okay. Point number three. The third place joy comes from, oddly enough, is persecution. And we don't talk about that very much. It's not in Luke 10, but you know where the end of Luke goes. Luke ends with the death of Jesus. The largest collection of joy talk in the Gospels is, is not in Luke, it's actually in John. John 15, 16, and 17. Are you familiar with that text? It's all red letters. That is the biggest conglomeration of joy words in the Gospels. In other words, because those words are spoken on the night that Jesus is arrested to go and be tortured to death. In other words, while Jesus is on his way to the cross, his focus is joy. Amen. John 16, 22. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. 
and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. A parallel text is James 1 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. I don't know for certain if we get joy through suffering, but I do know this joy will get you through suffering. Amen. I know that in Acts 5 and 4, 4 and 5, that the apostles were arrested twice. The first time they're told, you better stop talking about Jesus, and they let him go. The second time they're said, they're, they're told, you were told not to talk about Jesus, and they're beaten. Now they should have been overwhelmed with shame. They should have had their tail tucked between their legs, going, Arr! but they get finished getting beaten, and they're like, Woo! Do it again. Amen. Acts five forty. They called the apostles in, had them flogged, and they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. What do you do with people like that? It reminds me of my son Aaron. Tell him to go to bed. He's not going to get in bed. He gets out. We get him spanking. Put him in bed. He gets hit 15, 20 times in one night. He doesn't. What do you do with somebody like that? What do you do? It's either crazy or crazy devoted. Jesus was persecuted and suffered and died, and there's something to be said about being like Jesus. A few highlights. From John 15, 18 through 21. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Yes. They will treat you this way because of my name. Amen. One of the best things you can do is suffer for the cause of Christ. Amen. I is here. Okay, this is good. I would like to make an introduction to you to someone who's very special. Don't turn around and look. I'd like to make an introduction. Uh, there's someone very special, very special minister to the Lord here today. I'd like for you all to stand up, please, in respect for this person. Please, everyone. Even you guys doing audio-visual good. The special minister that I would like to introduce to you today is standing up right now. Every single one of you is a minister of the Lord. Amen. Contrary to popular belief, some people say, no, 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 you've got to be have a calling. You are a minister if you are here. That is why you're here. Ephesians 4.12 says you come here to be equipped for your ministry. Amen. You are all ministers. Don't forget that. Right. Go and sit down. That begs the question. If I gave you a piece of paper and said, I want you to write down what your ministry is. Could you do it? Do you know what your ministry is? You can't write down, well, my ministry is being a good Christian, and I go to church and read the Bible. That's not a ministry, folks. You don't have a ministry of, my ministry is to myself. That's not a ministry. Your ministry outreaches to somebody. If you cannot say, this is who I'm touching with my ministry, then you ain't got one. Right. Amen. You need to have a ministry, and if you don't know what your ministry is, you need to sit down with Pastor Jeff or something and figure out what your ministry is going to be. Because one day you're going to be held accountable. God's going to say, how was your ministry? You can't say, well, I studied your word. He's just going to laugh. That's not a ministry. I'm going to share something with you that Satan doesn't want you to know. The biggest reason that people do not minister today is fear. It's not fear of being beaten. It's not fear of being flogged. It's not fear of even, even something minor physically. Our fear is a fear of failure, ridicule, rejection, embarrassment, laughter, disappointment, and humiliation. That's what we're afraid of in Beaumont, Texas in 2020. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to suffer for the cause of Jesus. Trust me, 
If you suffer for Jesus, if you suffer for Jesus, you will have an unexplainable and God-given joy. Amen. Well, that's the point of my lesson. I'm going to sum it up with a short recap to make sure that you understand what I'm trying to say because I really didn't come to convince you that Jesus laughed. It's not really the point. I came here to tell you three things. Number one, your name is written in the book of life. There's your joy. Amen. Number two, you are filled with the Spirit of God. There's your joy. Number three, if the sources of joy for Jesus and his life and ministry are duplicated in your life and ministry, there's your joy. There's your joy. You may be looking back at 2020 and be really depressed. Friends or family may have died. You may have lost your job, your retirement income. You may have lost touch with your friends because you couldn't visit. You may be suffering because you can't socialize. You may even feel like your ministry is over before it even began. You may be reeling because of finances or politics or social injustices. You may be reeling because of a lack of community. You may be reeling because of a lack of a future. You may be reeling because you have a lack of faith right now. Or maybe for whatever reason, 2020 related or not, a relationship, a job, family, friends, I don't know. Whatever reason, maybe you simply lost your joy. Maybe you're saying, I can't have joy right now because of whatever the reason is. Maybe that's what you're feeling. But let me tell you this. Gary, don't give up. Don't give up. Endure this persecution that you're going through. Right. Don't give up. No. We had a man get on stage now. Focus on your ministry. And don't let Satan tell you it's over before it even began. Don't give up. Don't give up because COVID is a threat. Don't give up because money's tight. Don't give up because people are going to laugh at you. Don't give up. The stakes are too high. Don't give up. Because what you do with your ministry is going to have lasting effects exponentially more than what they are right now. You don't know if the grandson or the granddaughter of a person you spoke to at work is going to have a ministry that affects millions. You don't know. Don't give up. For it is the joy of the Lord that is our strength. And Jesus is our model. Hebrews 2, 1, 12, 1 through 2 says, Let us also lay aside every weight of sin which clung so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. Amen. Jesus went to the cross for you. So tell me, what's so bad that you can't do something? Don't give up on your ministry. Don't never even start your ministry. When you've got the joy of the Lord to carry you through, that's all you need. Don't give up. 2020 has been a tough year, but Jesus came once, and let me tell you, assuredly, He's going to come again. Don't give up.